illustration, absolutely, to illustrate the point if you're not so familiar with seeing those molecular structures. I think what we presented, the parsimonious way to interpret this, arsenic was absolutely associated with the DNA fraction, purified on a gel. To address what Steve's saying, how it survived all the manipulation, if you're aware of how we do DNA extraction, unknown. It migrates at a different level. I'll be a bit technical for a second. Migrates at a different rate. I think it's supercoiled. I've done things like cesium chloride gradients. Again, a little bit technical. It's weird. And I'll be honest, that I've been asked a question like, well, what did you think? Were you eureka? No, I'm a biochemist. I said, this isn't right. Something's wrong. I must have made a mistake. And you'll see there's a laundry list of fantastic co-authors. And I got a reputation at, at meetings. Somebody would give a talk, whoa, I think that's a type of mass spectrometry. You could do this. And so they see me coming. They wouldn't know who I was, but they knew that I was going to ask them to measure something for me. And often I asked them to do it blindly. And they often said, and if I were there, we would stare at the data, and they would sit back, very experienced scientists. What, what am I looking at? No, 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 what, what do you think it looks like? No, no, Felisa, what's in the sample? No, 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 what do you think it looks like? It's often 2 a.m., you know. So, so the answer, uh, from my viewpoint, in how much arsenic is substituting, I, I think right now we don't know. If you look at the data that we're presenting in the paper, it varies. And again, to be technical for one moment, we've measured these cells in stationary, so it's old age for the cell. So they've, they've reached a point, you grow, 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 stop. And, and so the idea there is there, normally we run experiments a little differently. So if you look on our supplementary evidence, we, we've showed all, we're very transparent. There is absolutely some phosphorus left in these cells. But what's unambiguous about those numbers is it is not enough to support the growth that we observe. Right, 2.8 femtograms, it's just not enough. So to support that growth, we can estimate what we call this in science, the back of the envelope calculation. We can squint and see that pattern in nature that our data are telling us. We can estimate how much total phosphorus you need at a very low, how many ribosomes, how much, gen how much you need in the genome, how much you need on your proteins to turn them on and off. It's called protein phosphorylation. If we have the analogous problem with arsenic, how much you might need in the lipid. It's just too little. It, it's just flat out too little. Do we have a crystal structure yet? No. I have collaborators working on that. Do we know the genome yet? No, but we're going to work on that. And the point was, it could be maybe it's just A's and T's. Maybe it's just G's and C's. Maybe it's one out of every 10 or two out of every four. Uh, great question. So what we're not suggesting, in my paper, I, I tried to write it in a very clear manner. What I'm not suggesting is that it's the entire microbe is made of arsenic. Absolutely not. I'm very, very transparent. My co-authors, we, we spent a lot of time being very careful. We're not really speculating. We wanted to present the phenomena to the community and to the public. Say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. If you notice how I an end it, I, you know, I've, I had been reviewing some of the greats. I stand on the shoulders of giants and I know that. I went to Mono Lake because it's well studied. It's easy accessible. It's in the United States. We studied an Amer with an American team on American soil with American money. And I went to this to really you know, I, I reread the Double Helix paper, and I reread Stanley Miller's paper and plate tectonics. Just present the observation and the data so that we can make those forward progress. I think understanding how much, what does it do during log growth? Let's say we give it arsenic and phosphorus. What happens? I actually know, but I'm not going to talk about it here today. I'm well on to the next paper, so I'm a little more confident than I would have normally been with someone as esteemed as uh, Steve Benner in the room. Uh, I've, I've been working on the next paper. should be submitted in February. <laughs> Maybe we can turn the question back to our colleague from Nature. I mean, the question is, you've taken a biochemistry course, and what do you <laughs> remember from your metabolic pathways that you were taught, forced to memorize for the examination, and perhaps promptly forgot? So when you <laughs> biosynthesize DNA, right, the phosphate comes from a nucleoside triphosphate, where the phosphorus that ends up in the DNA is the one directly bound to the ATP, deoxy ATP, deoxy GTP, and so on. And that phosphorus gets to that species by a 17-step metabolic pathway, which I'm sure you can write out on a piece of paper. Having to interrupt. I'm gonna, I got to interrupt you, Steve. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> AM, AMAS, adenosine monoarsenate, which would be, you saw that backbone we went down the, I call that the roller coaster when we made the animation. One of those nucleotides, so A, T, G, C, that you're all hopefully familiar with, is, is has a sugar as a base and the phosphate. AMAS forms spontaneously in a test tube, while AMP does not. And so in terms of, of thinking about 
Mm, he hasn't read the paper. So AMAS does form spontaneously in a test tube on the order of minutes. Well, AMP requires an enzymatic system. This isn't my work. This was done in the 80s. It was to understand, it was actually an accident of the finding, and I'd be happy to give you the citation, and we cite it in the paper. It was to understand the toxicity of arsenic. AMAS forms spontaneously at room temperature in a test tube. A That's not the uh, phosphorus that ends up in the DNA. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. <laughs> this is getting to a scientific debate here. We have some questions from the West Coast. And following, you guys can get together and hash it out. Um, let's, 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 let's go to the West Coast, uh, the Ames Research Center. Uh, we have questions. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. This is Rob Artigo at KGO Radio in the Bay Area. And uh, the question should be directed to Dr. Wolf Simon. Uh, as to your non Eureka moment, um, Apparently, you didn't suspect this might be the case or hypothesize that this might be the case. What were you doing at the moment? Uh, what were you looking for at the moment at, that you stumbled across this? Or did you, in fact, think p potentially this was the case? I'm sorry. I don't exactly understand the question. Um, what was I doing at the particular moment in terms of what of the analyses or what kind of uh, experiments I was running? But look at it this way. What were you looking for so that you, uh, you, you didn't hypothesize that this, this, this microbe lived as it did or as it does, um, but you found it anyway? I mean, that happens all the time in science. I'm sorry. Perhaps uh, uh, we were unclear. I, 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 had, I had been thinking about the idea of arsenic substituting for phosphorus for some time. So I, it was an absolutely directed test. The question I was asking was, can arsenic substitute for phosphorus in a living microbe? So I ran the experiment where we grew it in a broth, in a liquid, an artificial liquid, where we gave uh, the, the mud from Mono Lake as the initial source of the microbes, everything it needed except no phosphorus with a high dose of arsenic. So um, I'm sorry if that was unclear. I, this was a directed search. Does that answer your question? We'll go to the next question. I think that did. Uh, we have USA Today on the line. Go ahead. Uh, USA Today. Uh, a lot of our uh, readers are already commenting online. They're disappointed you didn't pull an ET out of a hat and have him dance on the stage. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about those expectations. Uh, uh, you know, uh, our readers are seem to be have been expecting a uh, walking, talking alien. Uh, can you put this into perspective for them instead of what you found? That's a, that's a question um, in perspective of the speculation was fiction, the facts. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess what I would say is that, well, um, certainly being able to announce the discovery of an extraterrestrial would be an incredible announcement. Um, we feel that uh, from our perspective and our understanding of biology here on Earth and what we base all the research that we do, because in astrobiology to some extent on our laboratory Earth, this is a phenomenal finding. We are talking about taking the fundamental building blocks of life and replacing one of them with an unusual, or with, with a, perhaps not unpredicted, but, a, but another compound. In our mind, this is the equivalent, and there are some of us that remember seeing these original Star Trek episodes and others that maybe see them on rerun on TV land. But if you remember, uh, is it Dark Evil and the Horta? So this is, in our mind, the equivalent of finding that Horta, which is a silicon-based life, substituting carbon, which is what we think all life forms are made of, with silica. Now we're talking about an organism that we think, if not replacing all of it, is it appears to be using another fundamental component of life. It, the story isn't entirely carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, the other elements we mentioned are important as well. It's replacing phosphorus with arsenic. This is a huge deal. This is, you know, we mentioned it's going to require at least some paragraphs in a textbook to be rewritten, uh, perhaps. And, um, you know, th this is a big finding. And so that's, uh, I'm sorry if they are disappointed, uh, but there are uh, lots of people, including Jim and the future research he's already planning, that see this as a, a, a huge uh, finding and a significant um, 
uh, a significant finding that's going to lead to new areas of research and will fundamentally change how we define life and therefore how we will look for it. Maybe we'll be able to find ET now because we've got more information about what we might be looking for. Okay, here's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to keep this under an hour. So I'm going to take one more question. We have many more, but we, we can do that as follow-ups. So Irene from Discovery, you go ahead and have the last question and then swing it back to me and we'll close out. Go ahead, Irene. Thanks very much. I um, actually have two questions. The first um, is about the experiment itself. How much time passed um, before the microbes were able to make the transition from their normal media to one that was primarily um, arsenic. And then uh, for Steve, um, maybe if you could just maybe generally discuss a follow-up experiment that would leave you more of a believer, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. So, so I'll answer first, apparently, this time. <laughs> I learned that lesson quick. Uh, so in terms of the time frame, they, the microbes never experienced normal, what you might call normal environment. I went straight from the environment. Um, straight from Mono Lake into this, this artificial lake water where we mimic what the lake would look like. We add everything it needs, again, vitamins and sugar and everything else, just no phosphorus and lots of arsenic. So there was never a transition, transition period. Yeah, I, I guess that's a good question. Um, keep in mind that, I, as I think I mentioned a moment ago, um, I think that the organism, the reported organism, will survive scrutiny. I think that this is going to be a very important organism for us to study to try to understand how an organism adapts to phosphorus-poor and arsenic-rich environments, because certainly me as an organism cannot do so. Um, the kinds of experiments that I would, of course, start with would be uh, I, I hate to be too technical, but radioactive isotope labeling experiments. Uh, uh, Felisa did do some work with her paper with radioactive arsenic. There's also radioactive phosphorus. I would be looking at, for example, that band on the gel in figure 2A, the one in lane 2 with a box around it, for those of you who have the paper, looking at that by arsenic radioactive autoradiography, arsenic radioactive imaging after I had fed radioactive arsenic to the bug and to see whether it is in fact concentrated in that band. I would certainly, of course, do the same thing with radioactive phosphorus in a ratio. I would start with a lot of phosphorus and little arsenic, both labeled, to a lot of arsenic and little phosphorus, both labeled, and see how the labels, because label, radioactive labels are very easy to see in a cell, see how they evolve in time. And I mean, uh, but Felisa, you know, I mean, I want, actually, I think you've actually got the sense of this, but when Felisa and I have talked about this for hours, may not days, um, the disagreement in science need not be personal. It can be factual, friendly, and constructive that way. The NASA Astrobiology Institute sort of emphasizes that, and the astrobiology program overall brings us together in a way that we, you know, have, um, we have uh, different backgrounds, different contexts, different cultures, and therefore we approach problems differently, and therefore the standards of proof that each of us have to meet in our respective communities are different, and so what you're seeing here is a perfectly healthy interaction between two different communities as we try to apply our standards of proof to somebody else's results. So these are the kinds of experiments as a chemist I would do next. Okay, we're going to wrap it up, and for the media, and there are many on the line and elsewhere, these uh, incredible scientists will be available for follow-up interviews. I want to thank the panelists and, of course, to Jim down in Tempe. Uh, kudos again to you, Felisa, and your team. I also want to acknowledge the continued incredible work of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, which continues to awe and inspire the world with scientific discoveries. You can get all of the information on www.nasa.gov. And for those who know me, you know I cannot leave without saying it, science never sleeps. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>